Hey guys, Lord Naren White here, the Holy Ghost, the one true God. Back with you with the next video in my series reading, The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn by Mark Twain. Without further ado, returning to The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn, as read by Lord Naren White. Ida heard her if she'd said it her to herself, let alone speaking it out. And I'd a got up and obeyed her if I'd been dead. As we was passing through the setting room, the old man, he took up his hat, and the shingle nail fell out on the floor, and he just merely picked it up and laid it on the mantel shelf, and never said nothing and went out. Tom see him do it, and remembered about the spoon and says, Well, it ain't no use to send things by him no more, but he ain't reliable, then he says. But he done us a good turn with the spoon. Anyway, without knowing it. And so we'll go and do him one without him knowing. Stop up his rat holes. There was a noble good lot of them down cellar. And it took us a whole hour. But we done the job tight and good in ship shape. Then we heard steps on the stairs. And blowed out our light and hid. And here comes the old man. With a candle in one hand. And a bundle of stuff in the other. Looking as absent minded as year before last. He went a-mooning around, first to one rat hole and then another, till he'd been to them all. Then he stood about five minutes picking tallow drip off of his candle and thinking. Then he turns off slow and dreamy towards the stairs, saying, Well, for the life of me, I can't remember when I'd done it. I could, na I could show her now that I wasn't to blame on account of the rats. But never mind, let it go. I reckon it wouldn't do no good. And so he went on a mumbling upstairs, and then we left. He was a mighty nice old man, and always is. Tom was a good deal bothered about what to do for a spoon. But he said we'd, have to, we'd, we'd got to have it, so he took a thing. When he had ciphered it out, he told me how we was to do. Then we went and waited around the spoon basket till we see Aunt Sally coming. And then Tom went to counting the spoons and laying them out to one side. And I slid one off one of them up my sleeve, and Tom says, Why, Aunt Sally, there ain't but nine spoons yet, she says. Go long to your play, and don't bother me. I know better. I counted them myself. Well, I've counted them twice, Auntie, and I can't make but nine. She looked out of all patience, but of course she come to count anybody would. I declare to gracious there ain't but nine, she says. Why, what in the world? Plague take the things. I'll count them again. So I slipped back the one I had. And when she got done counting, she says, Hang the troublesome rubbish. There's ten now. And she looked huffy and bothered both. But Tom says, Why, Auntie, I don't think there's ten. You numbskull. Didn't you see me counting? I know, but... Well, I'll count them again. So I smouched one. And they come out nine. Same as the other time. Well, she was in a tearing way, just a trembling all over. She was so mad. But she counted and counted till she got that addled. She started, she'd start to count in the basket for a spoon sometimes. And so three times they come out right and three times they come out wrong. Then she grabbed up the basket and slammed it across the house and knocked the cat galley west. And she said, clear out and let her have some peace. And if we come bothering around her again betwixt that dinner, she'd skin us. So we had the old, the odd spoon and dropped it in her apron pocket while she was a-giving us our sailing orders. And Jim's got it all right, along with her shingle nail before noon. We was very well satisfied with this business, and Tom allowed it was worth twice the trouble it took, because he said now she couldn't ever count them spoons twice alike again to save her life and wouldn't believe she'd counted them right if she did, and said that after she'd about counted her head off for the next three days, he judged she'd give it up and offer to kill anybody they wanted to ever count them any more. So we put the sheet back on the line that night and stole one out of her closet and kept putting it on back and stealing it again for a couple of days till she didn't know how many sheets she had any more, and she didn't care and weren't a-going to bully-rag the rest of her own her soul of out about it, and wouldn't count them again not to save her life. She'd rather die first. So we was all right now. 
as to the shirt and the sheet and the spoon and the candles, by the help by the help of the calf and the rats, the mixed up counting, and as to the candlestick, it weren't no consequence. It would blow over by and by. But that pie was a job. We had no end of trouble with that pie. We fixed it up away down in the woods and cooked it there. And we got it done at last, and very satisfactory too. But not all in one day. And we had to use up three washpans full of flour before we got through. And we got pretty burnt much all over. In places and eyes put out with the smoke, because you see we didn't want nothing but a crust. And we couldn't prop it up right, and she would always cave in. But of course, we thought the right way at last, which was to cook the latter too in the pie. So then we laid in with Jim the second night, and tore up the sheet all in little strings and twisted them together. And long before daylight we had a lovely rope that you could a hung a person with. We let on it took nine months to make it. And in the forenoon we took it down to the woods, but it wouldn't go into the pie. Being made of a whole sheet, that way there was rope enough for forty pies if we'd have wanted them, and plenty left over for soup or sausage or anything you choose. We could have had a whole dinner, but we didn't need it. All we needed was just enough for the pie, and so we throwed the rest away. We didn't cook none of the pies in the wash pan, afraid the solder would melt, but Uncle Silas, he had a noble brass warming pan, which he thought considerable of, because it belonged to one of his ancestors, with a long wooden handle that come over from England with William the Conqueror in the Mayflower, or one of the early ships, and was hid away of Garrett, with a lot of other old pots and things that was valuable, not on account of being any account, because they weren't, but on account of them being relics, you know. And we snaked her out, private, and took her down there. But she failed on the first pies, because we didn't know how. But she come up smiling on the last one. We took and lined her with dough, and set her in the coals, and loaded her up with rag rope, and put on a dough roof, and shut down the lid, and put hop embers on top, and stood off five foot, with a long handle, cool and comfortable. And in fifteen minutes she turned out a pie that was a satisfaction to look at, but the person that edit would want to fetch a couple of kags of toothpicks along, for if that rope ladder wouldn't cramp him down to business, I don't know nothing what I'm talking about, and lay him in enough stomach ache to last him till next time too. Nat didn't look when we put the witch pie in Jim's pan, and we put the three tin plates in the bottom of the pan under the vittles, and so Jim got everything all right, and as soon as he was by himself, he busted into the pie and hid the rope ladder inside of his straw tick, and scratched some marks on a thin plate, and throwed it out of the window hole. Chapter 38 Making them pens was a distressed tough job, and so was the saw, and Jim allowed the inscription was going to be the toughest of all. That's the one which the prisoner has got to scrabble on the wall. But he'd have to, he'd had to have it. Tom said he got to. There was no case of a state prisoner not grabbling the inscription to leave behind, and his coat of arms. Look at Lady Jane Grey, he says. Look at Guilford Dudley. Look at old Northberland. Why, Huck, suppose it is a considerable trouble. What you going to do? How you going to get around it? Jim's got to do his inscription and coat of arms. They all do. Jim says, Why, Mars, Tom, I ain't got no coat of arms. I ain't got nothing but this year old shirt. And you knows I got to keep the journal on that. Oh, you don't understand, Jim. A coat of arms is very different. Well... I says, Jim's right anyway, when he says he ain't got no coat of arms because he ain't. I reckon I know that, Tom says, but you bet he'll have one before he goes out of this, because he's going out right, and there ain't going to be no flaws in his record. So whilst me and Jim filed away at the pens on a brick bat apiece, Jim a making his'n out of the brass and I'm making mine out of the spoon, Jim set to work to think out of the coat of arms. By and by, he said he'd struck so many good ones, he didn't hardly know which to take, but there was one which he reckoned he'd decide on. He says, On the scutcheon, we'll have a bend or in the dexter base, a saltire murray in the fess, with a dog, couchant, for common charge, and under his foot a chain embattled, for slavery, with a chevron vert and a chief engrailed, 
and three infected lions on a field azure with the nombril points rampant on a dense set indented crest a runaway black sable with his bundle over his shoulder on a bar sinister and a couple of gwheels for supporters which is you and me motto magior freta minor auto got it out of a book means the most haste the less speed chief wilkins i says but what does that mean what does the rest of it mean we ain't got no time to bother over that he says we've got to dig in like all get out well anyway i says what's some of it what's a fess a fess a fess is you don't need to know what a fess is i'll show you i'll show him how to make to make it when he gets to it we'll go ahead and stop there for this week as usual i want to say thank you for watching and i hope you enjoyed please like comment and subscribe as it greatly helps the channel light be with you all take care and thanks again